views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. The following audio is via a Skype call. Welcome to the hit show, Raging Skillet Radio, mouthing off with Chef Rossi. Each show, Rossi, a.k.a. Chef Rossi, and author of the hit memoir, The Raging Skillet, mouths off about different subjects in a pursuit of breaking down walls and opening up our minds. Look out. She and Dr. Pat banter back and forth using the subject of each show as a framework for uplifting, inspiring, and what exuberant conversations. So get ready for that appetizer that will wet your whistle as we lean into the main course of the day. Issues, conversations, things that are heavy on your minds, but lightening up your heart and ending each show off with that sweet, sweet, sweet dessert of inspiration. Now, here is your host, Chef Rossi. Yeah, I'm Dr. Pat. Chef Rossi's here with me. We're te- we're, we're actually fabulous co-hosts for this topic today, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Aren't we? But first, I got to congratulate you. I got to congratulate you. Congratulations are in order for your award. Oh, thank you, sweetie pie. Yeah. Uh, We don't talk about this very much, but I just want to tell everybody, Chef Rossi is an amazing chef. Uh, And, you know, uh, Raging Skillet has won, like, a super-duper award. Like, what, how many years now for you? For the award. Well, we won uh, Best of Wedding Caterer in New York City, and this is um, the eighth year in a row. So I don't even yeah. know if anyone's ever done that for eight years, but it's pretty exciting. And it, the most exciting thing about it is that what the voting happens by clients. So you have mm-hmm. to have a lot of people who love you and love what you did. And so it's, it's way better than having judges who haven't actually tried what you do. Exactly. Well, you know, we have the same thing here with the show. Isn't it funny? We're both kind of talking about this um, because I think you and I have something in common. And we were just talking about this with Jessica and Benny on the last hour is that we strive better. We strive better and we strive for better. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't matter what we've done. We keep striving better and respond to clients, in my case, to listeners, to the people we work with. Mm -hmm. And we do it, though, also with a consciousness to reaching out in the world in this show and making Mm -hmm. sure we're not afraid to talk about important things. And Mm -hmm. today's show, for me, is super important. Oh, yeah, me too. It's really important. You know, Mm -hmm. I just had this uh, image in my head of this story a friend of mine told me. Uh, Mm -hmm. when you were saying about striving for better things. A good Mm -hmm. friend of mine named Ricky Negron, he's a very talented actor, singer, dancer, everything. He had a part for two years in In the Heights. That was the first play that, um, how do you say his name? The one who did Hamilton. Uh, Oh, my God, I'm having a brain fart. Anyway, but he had his first play was In the Heights, and Ricky got a part on it for two years, and it was a great part. But I said to him, like, how do you do the same thing, like eight shows a week, and, you know, bring enthusiasm to it? Um, Lin-Manuel Miranda was the one I was trying to think of. And he said, well, every day he gets on stage and he thought, you know, I'll just do a little more, a little better, a little stronger, a little deeper, a little different. And he said he challenged himself eight shows a week for two years by constantly just striving for that little bit of improvement every time he got on stage. And Mm. I guess if you can jazz yourself like that, I mean, like I've been catering for 27 years. Sometimes it's really hard to, like, pull your A game, you know. But if every time you go to work you just try to be just a little bit better, if it's at all possible, you know, you'll just keep challenging yourself. Oh, and I think that what we're talking about here is, you know, for me, Chef Rossi, it is both on the inside and outside. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, I get to look at how am I showing up on the outside based on what's going on on the inside of me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Absolutely. there's part of it, part, like we're talking today about me, never. Mm -hmm. And, you Absolutely. know, it's fascinating that we're talking about this because I was reading an article that the, you know, the woman that created Me Too is moving on, you know, to it, it's time to move on to a bigger conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to ask you, how do you, how do you make sense of the energy around this and why is it coming to the forefront mm -hmm. now? Oh, there's a very good reason for that. Look, this would not have exploded the way it did um, if this whole thing had happened a year ago or, mm -hmm. you know, I would say a little, uh, let's just say before Election Day or before mm -hmm. the campaign, a little more than mm -hmm. a year ago. Because, you know, we women, we're like, okay, well, maybe we suffered, um, but now we're going to have our first female president, and now the tide is changing. And what we learned during the campaign was that um, the man whose name I won't repeat, you know, said such terrible, terrible things about women when those Access Hollywood tapes came out. Mm -hmm. And so we assumed he could never, ever, ever win the election because this country could not possibly elect someone who so much believed in the disrespect and sexual harassment of women and had been busted pretty much saying that they could be grabbed by their private parts, whether they liked it or not, pretty much. You know, a long history of vulgarity and disrespect of women. So we just assumed that the country could never elect him. But then as the campaign is going on, what did we learn? We learned that there was a lot more sexism than we thought still was happening. Thought it had gotten better, and it really had not gotten better. And we learned that this country, not the popular vote, of course, three million more people voted for her, but this country still elected this man who had said so many disgusting, horrible things about women. And so... There's a humiliation and an anger, and for every woman who's been sexually harassed, who's been raped, who's been molested, who's been really disrespected sexually and put down by men, to have this guy become the president was like a slap in the face. Mm. And so it's a fire that's been brewing, and certainly it came out during the Women's March, but really in particular brewing. So when everything came out about Harvey Weinstein, you know, that was just, it just erupted. And it would not have erupted a couple of years ago when we hadn't already been feeling so disrespected and so put down by the choices that this country made. But having this guy in the White House really was, the, this was a kindling for a giant eruption. And so a lot of people are like, well, why so many things now? And I'm like, because this has been happening all along for so long. But only now is the moment ripe for people to listen because they're just fed up enough. And there's a lot of men out there who are really, truly respectful of women and have not harassed, oh, yeah. or have not mm -hmm. harassed anyone. And they're astonished at the level of it because so often women just don't speak out. I know my own story when I was being sexually harassed and, and having all sorts of things done to me when I tried to become a professional chef because women were not welcome in the kitchen. So they thought, well, they'll just bully me and sexually harass me and call me a lot of things besides my... I didn't say, I didn't speak out about it or, or anything. I just thought I'm strong and I'll get through it and I'll plow through it. And one day I'll start my own company, you know, but now is the time to speak out and maybe that could make a permanent change. So... If I have to say one and only one good thing that came out of the results of the election, it was the whole country waking up. And it really adds to our quote for today's show, our me never. Yeah. You know, over the weekend, um, for, for those of you that are um, following this, you're going to see a number of photos, a number of news, news reels talking about a march. Uh, to mm -hmm. take a stand against sexual abuse. What's mm -hmm. interesting about the news is, or at least 
who covered this news very little over the weekend. I, I'm actually mm-hmm. astonished. I'm actually ashamed of our our, our our news media. And you you know, here it is, this powerful march march, the imagery from it absolutely breathtaking is one image of a woman that nobody knows her name um and the image will will forever be with me but you know being somebody that is in the radio slash media business the brits are are covered it better than Mm. we did in this country the brits covered it better and you know people say well you know cnn was covering the more thing well okay maybe they were uh that's important too more than we even know but wait a minute wait a minute What's happening with this march? Why are people coming out? Elizabeth Perkins, I think, was one of the uh, more recent folks to come out. But here's the question. About James Woods. Yeah, here's the question. This is the question that people don't understand. I want to talk to you about this when we come back, Chef Rossi. Mm-hmm. Is why didn't a 14 year old say something at the time? Okay, we're going to talk about that. Why are these women coming out now? Well, we're going to talk about that. Why did they wait so long? Well, we're going to talk about that. Because unless you have walked in the shoes of a man or a woman, and I will say this, men get sexually abused too. Mm -hmm. You will not know this. But the shocker for the weekend for me, the shocker that I didn't get, what? The senators had to vote in a bill for sexual harassment training. Let's take a short break. That tax money should have been spent a long time ago. Let's take a short break, everyone. What? They're not trained? We'll be right back. Tune in to Lucid Planet Radio with Dr. Kelly Neff. This hit show will illuminate your senses and empower you beyond your daily stressors and hardships. Renowned psychologist and author Dr. Kelly will captivate you with far-reaching topics and amazing guests as you wake to the greatest version of yourself. Learn to tap into your intuitions, think critically about our world, heal emotional and psychological wounds, and follow your passions to live your dreams. The Lucid Planet. Welcome home. Visit lucidplanetradio.com for more information. What is a brilliant culture, and how do we create them? Why are they important? Claudette Rowley has created a breakthrough five-step process to help you align your culture with your business strategy for exceptional results. Looking for a culture that drives organizational excellence? Listen to Cultural Brilliance Radio, the second and fourth Friday of each month at 10 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern on Transformation Talk Radio. To learn more or work with Claudette, visit culturalbrilliance.com. Are you looking for the perfect setting for your next workshop or retreat? At Spirit Fire Meditative Retreat Center, cultivating consciousness is what we do best. Our guests count on us to create an atmosphere that supports serenity and well-being. We lead from the heart and create space for the mind. Freshly prepared meals designed with local and organic ingredients, 95 acres of beautiful woods and pastures, and a facility built with green in mind. This is what you'll find at Spirit Fire. For more information, visit spiritfireretreatcenter.com. Do you ever feel as if you're working twice as hard but only getting half as far? Are you trying to connect with your path in life and finding it elusive? Mainstream Metaphysics Radio is a weekly call-in show where we harness our connection with the universe and use what is in our power to affect change for optimal success and happiness. This hit show bridges the divide between what is and what we do not know. Eve, named one of the country's top psychics, also known as the MBA Psychic, invites you on this journey for this live call-in show with readings, featured guests, leaders, and visionaries in both business and spiritual callings. So join Eve Thursdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com as she takes metaphysics mainstream. For more information about Eve, visit EliteTarot.com. That's EliteTarot.com.
Best-selling author, spiritual life, and business coach Joe Nunziata brings his higher energy and no-nonsense style to people who are ready to make powerful changes now. Wake up, step up, power up with a shot of Joe. Join Joe the second and fourth Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern for 30 minutes of high energy, no-nonsense, and powerful tools to make powerful changes. Visit joenuns.com. That's J-O-E-N-U-N-Z.com. Well, hey, everyone, welcome back. You know, this is Raging, Raging Skillet Radio with uh, amazing woman, Chef Rossi. Yeah, this is our mouthing off with Chef Rossi. I'm Dr. Pat. I'm really honored. I'm, first of all, I have to say this about Chef Rossi. You know, this is a show Chef Rossi could do all by herself. And I need to say I'm really honored, you know, that you've asked me to play in this arena with you. Um, it is very different than any radio show I do. Um, you and you and I show up as co-hosts in this. Uh, we talk about things that are important in the world. Um, and I really am honored, uh, Chef Rossi, that you, you have asked me to join you on this journey. Oh, absolutely, Mama. I love doing this show without you. I would not have nearly as much fun without you. Because first of all, you're a powerful woman and you're deep and you're kind and you're smart. And like, I get a whole hour to hang out with you from across the country. So. <laughs> than that, you, know? Uh, you know, I want to give people an update. First of all, uh, Raging Skillet, you know, let's talk about the book. There's a book mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then there's a play. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, before we jump back into this, can you give us an update on the book? And again, people can sure. buy the book as well. Uh, the play and let, let's talk about what you're doing in that area to bring the message okay. forward. Well, uh, the book, The Raging Skillet, it was published by the Feminist Press, and you can buy it from the Feminist Press, which is like feministpress.org. Um, you can easily get it at uh, Amazon. And your local bookstore, if they don't have it, will order it for you. I know Barnes & Noble will order it for you, but it's nice to support the, you know, the mom-and-pop local bookstore, too. We love them, and we need them. Um, the play was adapted by Jacques Lamar. He, I met him on the book tour, and he adapted my book for the stage, and we just had five crazy sold-out standing ovation smash hit week mm. in Hartford, Connecticut at Theater Works. Mm. It was insane. I mean, everyone who saw it said they'd never seen anything like it. I, I just had dinner with the actress who played me. There's a good reason to go to therapy right there. Like, I got to go see a play with someone who's playing <laughs> me. I mean, it was crazy. And she said that she'd never seen anything like it. Like, the audience was dancing and going nuts and same show that they're screaming and clapping and dancing. They're also crying. I mean, it was really amazing. So um, I'm putting the word out there to everyone and anyone in the universe to get the play out to theaters around the country because it's really like a joy festival, and it really has to keep on moving and keep on going. And because the New York Times doesn't cover regional theater, the only people who know about it are the people who know about it, who went to the show or read the press in Connecticut or we're told about it by one of the many people who saw it, which I think is over 7,000 or so people. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of putting it out there. So if you um, have a theater in your in your town, you know, tell them about this crazy, amazing play. That's I know we're looking in Seattle. I know we're looking here because Seattle to. is – Seattle and San Francisco. I have a friend in San Francisco, and I got her beating the doors down um, for it because Seattle is a great place for this, and so is San Francisco. Not that L.A. is not. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, now that I mention it, I'm going to I'm gonna call Mike Horn. I'm going to ask Mike about L.A. So, I, I mean, this is how we all come together to help each other, right. though, isn't we it, Jeff? We have Jefferson? to help each other. Yeah, we have to. Um, this really brings the topic that that's next is, you know, talking about why are you and I here? You know, mm -hmm. what is it about this, about the topic, about me never? Or mm -hmm. why, why are we in the Me Too category? Um, I don't know. And maybe there are some, uh, but I don't know of any women in my generation for sure 
my generation that haven't been subjected to this in some way. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes it's more subtle. Sometimes it's more it's it's blatant sexual harassment. Uh, you'll get promoted if you do this. Uh, mm-hmm. All of the above. But now people are talking about it. The stories are horrific. That's mm-hmm. the thing for me that I'm struck by. We're not just talking about, oh, oh that comment. My God, chef, right? You walk down the street in New York, right? You ever do that? Mm-hmm. With a pair of heels and walking down? Yeah. That's not what we're talking oh, about it. here. Yeah. We're, but we're not talking about that. But we're not talking about being cat no. cat called when you go by a construction no, site. We're no, talking no, no. about being harassed and intimidated and bullied. I mean, sexual harassment, somehow people think sexual harassment and being bullied are two different things. I think they're the same thing. Yeah, they are the same. You know, you can be very intimidated. I mean, many times I was in uncomfortable situations because I didn't want to speak out or yell out or cause a scene because the person who was intimidating me sexually was my higher up or my boss or someone in a power position. And it just comes about everywhere. I mean, it's not just actors who are getting it, although, Lord, they certainly are, but it's like everyone. You know, I was a freelance writer for a while, and editors had a very powerful position that they could have easily abused, and some did and some didn't, you know, and really kind of the same. Head chefs to the junior chefs like me, the secretary to the boss. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. why um, sexual harassment is such an important thing to govern against in the workplace because you have a power position it's very intimidating, and it's hard to protect against. Mm-hmm. Look, all this stuff happening with Louis C.K. Oh. You know, I have to say, I'm one of the few people I know who never liked him. I never, ever liked him, and it's always for the same reason. He's very funny, and he gets away with a lot, but underneath it all, I always have the feeling that there's something kind of mean-spirited about him. Mm. And I guess I'm not drawn to mean-spirited comedians, although the world loves them, Lord knows. But now it's come out that he's been really um, intimidating and harassing of so many women by wanting to masturbate in front of them. You know, mm. so I'm here to say, you know, if there's any men listening to this show, you know, that if we wanted you to masturbate in front of us, you know, we would ask. But generally speaking, women do not enjoy watching men masturbate in front of them. It's like a general thing. But if you're in a couple and you ask and it's part of what you do, that's fine. If you're in a situation where you've got a fully clothed woman still in her street clothes and you just decide to whip it out and start doing it in front of her, same thing with Harvey Weinstein, the same thing. That is abuse, and it's it's something in the category of, I don't know if I'm going to say rape, but I'll say mental rape. Like, Lord, you know, your eyes are never the same after you see something that you don't want to see like that. It's well, really I mean, disgusting. think about it. If if you can get if you can get fired for for what's the article say? And this, let me read the article title for those of you out there. Uh, you know, if you're going to send me an email about it, was the was firing the woman who flipped off the president too harsh? If we even have to ask that question, and yet we're questioning about whether or not to expose ourselves, there's something wrong. Uh, there's an article that uh, I okay. I have a background in HR. I just want to say I don't I don't belong to any HR organizations and this is why. I'm looking at the Society for Human Resource Management uh, SHRM S H R M. Finally, hello, November 13th an article workplace sexual harassment me too or not us. Where does your company come down on preventing and addressing sexual harassment? Hello SHRM. Why don't you create a board so that employees can come to you and come outside their organization when things like this going on? But, you know, here's what I love about what they say. You ready? Mm -hmm. Sexual harassment cuts across all professional industries as validated by the recent Me Too campaign. What? Mm -hmm. SHRM, you had to wait for the recent campaign? Mm -hmm. What? Because the the recent campaign is making, is forcing you. Or your you're, you're the people we go to for HR stuff. This is what I'm talking about. Everybody's afraid. Everybody's afraid to talk about it. You know, okay. I got to say. By the way, that woman who got fired for giving the finger to the president, uh, if, if that's a fireable offense, her giving the finger to the president, that he should be fired for having given the fingers 
to women, you know, in his entire public life. I mean, calling them fat, calling them ugly, saying he can grab them, like all of the disgusting, derogatory, disrespectful things he's done and said to women in his entire life, which has been documented, well documented. Mm -hmm. If but someone's going to be fired for giving him the figure, he should be fired for giving the finger to all of the women in this country. But let's get this, let's tie this back to the original questions we had. Mm -hmm. sure. And they were this. Why would women wait 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Why? Well, here's why. If you can get fired for flipping off the president, how safe do you feel it might be to actually accuse somebody of something much more Mm -hmm. formally abusive and bullying. Now, I'm not saying I agree with flipping off anybody because personally, that's not anything I do. I don't do it in my life now. Not that I haven't done it, you know, like as a well, street that, kid, it's, but it's, it's not, not in my nature to do it. However, there's a reason why women don't speak up, right, Chef? Well, the repercussions are really enormous. Like so many women who have actually been raped, especially when something is as confusing as a date rape, don't speak out because they don't want to be dragged through the mud, you know, while the opposing lawyer is making them seem like they're a slut or a whore, and they don't want to be exposed and humiliated and basically raped all over again in a courtroom. They don't want to go through that. Yeah. And also, they don't want to blow the whistle on their boss because they don't want a black cloud in front of them. They don't want to be, you know, a lot of times when you speak out against being sexually harassed, it's like you're sort of humiliating being humiliated all over again. It's a lot to go through. I mean, I myself had an experience um, not so long ago where I had an opportunity to confront someone who had um, that really attempted to do some, something terrible to me when I was 17 years old. Mm. And I, I had, you know, I spoke about it with some friends because I, I had that chance and they were like, oh, don't do it. it. You know, it never works out as fulfilling as you think, you know. But it, I carried it from the time I was 17. So I had a chance to confront him and say, you did this to me when I was 17 years old. Or, you know, you attempted to do this to me when I was 17 years old. And what do you have to say about it? And I was hoping, you know, to get a, a heartfelt apology and some you know, dramatic, wonderful, healing moment. But uh, he, of course, had amnesia, which I know wasn't true. He's like, I'm sorry, I don't remember any of it. I was so young then. I was only, I don't know what he was, 22 or something. Um, so I didn't get that healing moment I was looking for. But at the same time, I made him spectacularly uncomfortable. And I thought, well, you know what? At least I got to humiliate him a little bit and make him feel uncomfortable. It was a good purge for me. Um, but I don't know, what did I wait, 35 mm -hmm. years or something, however long that mm -hmm. was? You know, I probably would have never said a word ever if it wasn't in the situation where I happened to re-meet this person. I've never confronted some of the bullying that I had to go through as a chef because it doesn't, um, doesn't feel good, you know, to get yourself humiliated all over again. So I understand yeah. the keeping quiet part, but... Here now with this movement, I think it's an excellent opportunity to really change things. Like, why should we have to be humiliated twice by speaking out when we're sexually harassed and molested and abused or raped or attempted rape? We shouldn't. We should be protected so it doesn't happen. And if it does happen, we should be protected when we speak out about it. The only way that we're going to stop these monsters is by making them feel as humiliated as we did. Well, you know, here we go. And, you know, this is what we do in this in this country. It's important for us to have a legal system of justice. It really is. See, I, I'm one of these people where I do believe in the justice system. My friends tell me I'm like super uber, like I'm uber naive. But I do believe in the justice system. And I don't know why I do. I don't have any attorneys in my family. Uh, but I do believe in this idea of innocence first. So mm -hmm. what I really look for, though, is uh, if I'm in L.A., what am I looking for? Well, 
what we now have finally is the DA in LA launches a special task force to pursue Hollywood, they call them Hollywood creeps, mm -hmm. a task force. And Good. so I'm going to ask you, how do you see that action? Uh, let's take a short break when we come back. I want to hear from Chef Rossi. What is the action? And I'd like to know from those of you out there, what is the action? What is actionable in your mind? What do you know? What would you say to women to help women create a voice for themselves? Uh, and what's, is it just me and Chef Rossi? Let's hear from you. 1-800-930-2819. 1-800-930-2819. Let's take a short break, everyone. We'll be right back. There was a time I used to look into my father's eyes. In a happy home, I was a king I had a go. Curious about the meaning of life? Do you want to deepen your spiritual practice? The School for Esoteric Studies offers online training to spiritual seekers from all paths of life and individual coaching. Our courses synthesize Eastern and Western spiritual traditions based on meditation, study, and service applied to everyday life. The school also organizes group meditations each year to benefit humanity. Whether you're just beginning to reflect on the spiritual side of your life or are a more experienced spiritual seeker, the school warmly welcomes you to join our group. To learn more about our courses and services, please visit esotericstudies.net. That's esotericstudies.net. On the cutting edge of the new mainstream, Christine Upchurch is passionate about bringing together science, psychology, and spirituality in a way that can be applied to our everyday lives for true transformation. The Christine Upchurch Show, stellar conversations to illuminate your journey, engages some of the most outstanding visionaries on the planet in lively dialogue to inspire you to become that bright light you're meant to be. Join Christine every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time on KKNW, AM 1150, and Transformation Time. Radio. Tune in to The Jen Royster Show, intuitive guidance to inspire your life, each Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific and 11 a.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. This amazing show is an inspirational hour that will take you on an epic metaphysical journey to discover the spiritual approach to life's greatest challenges. Dr. Jen is an internationally known intuitive counselor, spiritual teacher, and energy healer. Call in for intuitive readings and visit jenroyster.com for more information. A word of caution. If you prefer the status quo and you are not interested in improving every aspect of your life, this book will trigger the shift out of you. The Truth is Funny, Shift Happens is available now. Author Colette Steffen brings the powerful knowledge and life-changing energy and empowerment from the radio airwaves to the pages of her new book. To get your copy in paperback or ebook, visit thetruthisfunny.com today. Amber Teal, founder of The Healthy Edge, is bringing you the hit show Healthy Edge Radio, living with power, passion, and purpose. Amber provides the support and tools necessary for you to finally release the weight and emotions that are hidden beneath the weight. Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio. For more information on how you can take the next step with Amber, visit getthehealthyedge.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. This is Raging Skillet Radio, mouthing off with Chef Rossi and me, Dr. Pat. Today, the title of the show, what we're talking about is me, never. Mm -hmm. So for those of you out there that are familiar with what is called the Me Too movement uh, and what happened when that started, uh, and we're going to share a little bit about that, but also this is a conversation now of how to change the world, how to empower women and men. How do we do this in a way that helps 
everyone have an equal voice. Uh, but Chef, before we go ahead, Chef Rossi, please, website, how can people find out more about you? And for those of you that want some catering, you can find out about that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always find me at the RagingSkillet.com website. And there's information about the book tour. There'll always be current things happening. Information about the play, information about Raging Skillet Radio, um, about all the awards the Raging Skillet Catering Company's won. You know, there's always, like, stuff. And you can also email me through the RagingSkillet.com website. And um, it's fun to kind of check it all out, look at the photos mm-hmm. and menus and press. It's, fun, it's a fun mm-hmm. site. So, you know, let, here we go. I'm Dr. Pat. For more about me, go to the Dr. Pat Show or Transformation Talk Radio. Um, listen, I was reading an article. And the article uh, was the next step for hashtag me Too creator isn't a hashtag. Mm-hmm. So the article uh, was part of CNN, uh, uh, a CNN post. And it says, now that it's clear that sexual violence is a problem. I, this is funny. This is CNN. I cannot believe this, mm-hmm. that they say this. Not like it wasn't clear like when. Right. When wasn't Breaking it clear? News. Breaking news. Oh, my God. Now that it's clear that sexual violence is a problem. Oh, my God. I'm getting annoyed about this. I can't let that happen. The creator of hashtag me too would like the conversation to change. The names of the perpetrators don't matter anymore, activist and writer Tarana Burke said. It's time to focus on the systems that allow sexual violence to flourish. Hence, sexual harassment training for the senators. I don't know. Do the Congress get that too? No, it's just me, just the Senate, right? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to have Benny look that up because I we'll have I, to look that I, up. I I, I thought everybody was supposed to get it, but I just, me and my little world. Um, The the article goes on to say, Chef Rossi, there will always be a new person, she said. I want to keep the conversation, but it needs to progress. Um, Do you you agree with that? I do agree with it. It's interesting that we would never know about her if Elisa Milano hadn't hadn't spoken up. Because I think think Tarana, uh, how do you say her name? Tarana Burke, right? Yeah. Yeah, Tarana Burke. She was doing something on Twitter, and then Elisa Milano picked it up. And once she picked it up about the Me Too movement, then it, then it just kind of went to a new stratosphere. So there's something a little sad about the fact that you need a celebrity to make something, you know, valid, even though Tarana Burke had been working on this since 1997. The story I got was that a 13-year-old girl who had been uh, sexually abused was telling her her story, and it just kind of led her to start the Me Too campaign. Um, but now I think she's, I think she's got the celebrity backing now, so she'll go to another stratosphere and really kind of push it. And she's right. It's like, it's one thing like, um, the calling out the, the abusers is a good thing, but the more important thing is starting the movement and protecting women from it happening any further. Like all of these women have already been heard and it's probably a good thing to call out their abusers and stop them in their tracks and show the world what happens to abusers like Harvey Weinstein, what happened to him, is a really terrifying, scary thing to all of the other abusers in Hollywood. They're like seeing his career ending and seeing uh, Kevin Spacey's career ending, and it's making them kind of think twice, more so than almost anything else would do. But now it's like we have all these young women out there who maybe haven't yet been molested or abused or harassed. The more important thing is to prevent that from happening in the first place. And this is a wave, a powerful wave of kind of sweeping the country, waking up innocent men to what's happening to women and empowering women to speak out. And I'm hoping that that wave will keep rolling and rolling and rolling towards laws, like you said, Department of Justice laws and things like that, but also just towards changing the mindset of people. And there's a lot of men out there that, for whatever reason, they got the message that... um, no sort of means maybe, not no means no. And no means no. I mean, come on. If if you say no and it's still happening, that's rape. That's all there is to it. Mm. 
Yeah, and for those of you that are just text me, yes, this is a CNN, by the way, it was a CNN, um, not town hall, uh, tipping point town hall that was held on sexual harassment. Uh, and I think it was last week. So if you want to find out and hear the discussions here, you can go to CNN and figure that out. But uh, okay, Anita Hill, right? Mm-hmm, right? Everybody know who she is? Right. No, a lot of young people don't. Just want to say they don't. Yep, they don't. Um, Here's what she says. Until we can believe all women, every woman's voice has value. None of us really will be seen as equal. Boy, that is a mouthful. Mm -hmm. She's so right. Mm -hmm. And poor Anita Hill. I mean, what she went through trying to speak the truth. I mean, it was like she was was doubly humiliated. It's just Mm -hmm. what I was saying before. You try to speak out. And then, I mean, she went through probably worse hell after she spoke out than about the reason she spoke out. The article goes on to say this, and this is real, this is important in the empowerment conversation, Chef Rossi. It mm-hmm. goes on to say uh, what men can do. Now, I don't know about you, Chef, but every man I've ever talked with, I've ever coached, I've ever worked with, not a single one of them, every one of them, especially those that have daughters, when you talk to them about this issue, and of course, let's clear the plate, not the ones that are predators themselves, but when you talk to them about this issue, you can see the fire in their eyes. You can see it. So this is not something that is oblivious to men, but more importantly, we need men to help and participate. I think that what Burke said about this was men hold the cards when it comes to interrupting rape culture. Mm-hmm. And I think True. that's part of the conversation today, isn't it? Well, I think men hold the cards pretty much with everything, unfortunately. They mm-hmm. make more money. They have more power. They have more celebrity. There's like They have a whole different set of roles than women do. But what's happening now, I think, is that women are changing the rules. And we're kind of saying, yes, you may hold the power, but if you uh, break the rules and you treat us the way you've been treating us, we're going to take that power away. And I think there's nothing more frightening to a man than having his power taken away. No one likes that. You know, I want to ask you, let's talk about what empowerment means to women. And why it's important, an important conversation. People say, oh, empowerment word, oh, overused. I don't know. I don't think it's used enough. But rather than use the word, empower women is an action, isn't it? Can you talk about what that means to you? Well, it's interesting that you're saying that because I just had an experience recently. And this is a sneaky little thing where um, <laughs> very, very often, I always have a little story, right? We're very often... Um, The bad things and the moments that women lose their power are very often done to women by other women. That's a sneaky sneaky little thing, too. It doesn't necessarily go with the Me Too movement, but I'm just saying. So I had an experience recently where I had a a business meeting, and even though nothing bad had happened necessarily in the business meeting, I felt after the meeting very humiliated, and I couldn't understand why I felt humiliated. And I took notice because, you know, I'm a tough chick, so I'm very, very rarely humiliated. Usually Mm -hmm. the people who try, like, wind up pretty bruised. Um, But I felt humiliated, and I talked to my girlfriend about it, Lydia. She's a very smart chick, if you ever have a chance. I'll get her on Mm. the show one day. Beautiful. she, She said, was there a moment during that meeting when you gave your power away? Mm. And it was really a profound statement, but Mm -hmm. I had to really sit with it. I had to really think about it. And, in fact, there was. There was several moments in that meeting where I gave my power away, and it left me feeling humiliated. And I think with the Me Too movement, a lot of this is about women having had our power taken from us and also having given our power away. And there's nothing more humiliating and there's nothing more vulnerable, creating, humiliating, you know, that's a word, vulnerable, creating. <laughs> I love that. that. It's kind of fun. Anyway, then having your power taken from you or, or having it taken from you even as you gave it away. So 
I think that in this movement, it's not enough to speak out. Speaking out is great. I'm not saying that's not a good thing. But we have to reclaim our power. We have to keep our power. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're in a game where we're not the ones with the, holding the cards. Like you said, the men are holding mm-hmm. the cards. And we cannot give our power away. So something that would happen would be we have to teach our young girls and our women mm-hmm. to protect themselves, teach them to speak out, teach them to hold their power. And really, you know, this is what you have. This is your weapon. We may not be as physically strong as men, but we have got mouths that can be a hundred times louder when we use them. And that's a powerful weapon. You know, there's this article goes on to say, what can men do? Now, this is men and women. Mm-hmm. Um, when I worked for the telephone company, I worked in the facilities management organization back in the day when women didn't work in this organization. And clearly women in management didn't exist. I was the only woman at the time of divestiture for AT&T, and I was part of a team uh, that ultimately was one of seven people to work and start the, the divested telephone companies. But here's the scenario. I was put in the job. My director at the time didn't hire me. So I was put there by a very progressive forward uh, man, uh, Bob Davis. And here's the deal. Every staff meeting, my director, a different Bob, would start the meeting with the dirty joke. Now, here's what I want to say. It isn't always about the physical nature of, of sexual violence and sexual acts. Starting a meeting with a dirty joke mm-hmm. is not what we should be doing. No. Right? And then you're, you're basically saying that you have no respect for the women, mm-hmm. or in your case, the woman in that meeting. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's humiliating. And all the men, of course, will laugh, and then the woman's left feeling uncomfortable. It's horrible. Starting a meeting with a dirty joke is it has some sort of similarity to what Louis C.K. did. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's like you're sort of being masturbated on. I mean, it's horrible. Well, and the question then comes up, and I want to kind of get back to this, is why haven't women, why haven't we, we showed up? Why haven't we... Why haven't we talked about this? Why haven't we come forward? Why is it now a 14-year-old girl may come for, is coming forward? Mm-hmm. You know, people ask the question, why now? And I want to get back to something you said. What you said earlier, paraphrasing, was we thought it was going to be handled with the uh, an election result that we thought was going to happen. Having mm-hmm. a woman in office, we thought, and especially this particular woman, and we know what Hillary Clinton thinks about sexual violence and sexual harassment. So we thought that not only would it get handled, but we'd make new ground. When that didn't happen, we had to stand up, all of us, both men and women, we had to explore and decide what our values were. And then we had to decide what we were going to do about it. And isn't it interesting how the universe works to awaken, what, 8 billion people? Right. It's interesting. Yeah. It couldn't have happened. Couldn't have happened any other way. It's interesting that if Hillary had won, which, you know, like I said, she did win, but if she had become president, I think she would have been an amazing president and done some amazing things. But in a lot of ways, um, the country being so outraged and horrified that she didn't win led to the Women's March, led to the Me Too March, led to the Me Too movement. And sometimes really, really, really terrible things have to happen in order for really good things to happen. I think about how incredibly uptight the 1950s were with the MacArthur witch hunts and everyone having their lives ruined over this communism crap and everything being so uptight and... um, Uber conservative and and really horrible in a lot of ways, and that led to the explosion of the 1960s, where people were like, basically, no, we're not going to take it. 
we're not going to go to Vietnam. We don't believe in that war. We're not going to oppress people who are African American. We're not going to oppress people who are gay. We we are not with this. And the '60s, of course, changed the world. So now we have this era happening that feels frighteningly similar to The Handmaid's Tale. I don't know if you've mm-hmm. seen it yet. It's really, mm-hmm. I saw the original movie, and it was yeah. pure science fiction in the '80s. Yep. But yep. now, not so science fiction. Right, Women right. being told they can't work and they can't have bank accounts in their name. I mean, there's a lot of people in this country that would like that very much. So now we have this frightening era, but it is ushering in something, again, like a 1960s kind of revolution where we have to go back and, and explode all over again. And I think that's clearly happening and clearly, clearly needs to happen because... For a country to not, like, why is Roy Moore, like, why is he, why are we even looking at this guy's face anymore? <laughs> like, he's, he believes in having sex with 14-year-olds. Like, when Jerry Lee Lewis did this, people were throwing baby carriages on the stage with him. It ruined his career. Like, why is Roy Moore, why does he even have a career? He should be in jail. And people are like, oh, you don't understand, that's how we do it in Alabama. Well, I do not disbelieve that there are men in the Deep South, in Alabama, and everywhere else that think it's really cool to have sex with little girls. But I also believe that those men should be in jail, and then they get to find out what happens to sexual um, predators and the rapers of little girls in jail. They can have a really good time being raped themselves. So personally, I I, I think that's where Roy Moore should be. Well, I I think, you know, for me, my family's from the South, and I shared this with you. My stepmom had her first child at 12 and her second one at 13. Her husband was Garland. And so Mm -hmm. for me, Garland, so for me, you know, what I want to say is in different parts of our country, different things go on. But the South seems to take, I believe, an unfair portion of this kind of stuff only because it gets talked about. What I want to just be really clear about, this is a universal violation. Mm-hmm. This Absolutely. is this is Alabama, Albuquerque. You know, mm-hmm. this is New York. You mm-hmm. know, this is New Finland. This is something that is happening to women all over the world. Mm-hmm. The difference Absolutely. is it's not supposed to happen here. No, I know. Look, at right. it. it's clearly happening around the world. And I admit, as a New Yorker, you know, there's a lot of us going, well, that's how it is in Alabama. They're yeah. all sitting on their porch with their couch on their porch and their moonshine and having sex with little girls. And we all saw Bastard out of Carolina, and we think the South is all about that. But it's not true. It's a mm-hmm. universal thing. I um, had an art event I was at um, where we had different speakers and really was on the subject of women's rights. And one of the speakers had done work in third world countries. And she said that her greatest challenge was that she was working, and I forget which country, it was like, um, um, is on the African continent, that, that mm-hmm. I do know. Anyway, mm-hmm. her greatest work was having the word rape introduced into their language. They did not have that word in their language. There was nothing in their language that said it was wrong to have sex with a woman against her will. Mm-hmm. And she was out there trying to stop a terrible thing called breast ironing, which was that mothers yeah. would flatten the daughter's breasts so yeah. that they would continue to look like little girls so that they wouldn't be raped, because once they had breasts, they would be raped. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a horrible thing worldwide. But somehow we think in America like we're better than that. We're smarter and, and, you know, we're civilized and we've got all of this stuff going on and look at look how great we are. Like, as my friend Kim used to say, smell us. You know, we're like all that in a bag of chips, right? But no, you know, we still have someone running for public office who believes it's okay for him to have sex with 14-year-old little girls. We still have someone in the White House that thinks it's okay to grab women by their crotch whether they want it or not, you know. We have not come a long way, baby. Like yeah. I just heard that Virginia Slims commercial in my head. We definitely have not. We came a long way because we came very close to having our first female president. But we've got a long way to go. And yeah. it starts with women staying, keeping their power, speaking out, standing up, 
And the other thing is that we have to stick up for each other. Like women very often are not helping other women. So we've got to stick up for each other and help each other. And then it takes men listening, too. Yeah. You know, here's what I want to say. And let's first thank uh, everybody for tuning us in and turning us on. This hour goes so quickly, Chef Rossi. Oh, I know. Uh, It really does. One of the things that it's important to acknowledge that we're starting to hear from a lot of men about the behavior of this man and a Mm -hmm. 14-year-old. And I want to acknowledge that because the progress we make is directly proportionate to the amount of both men and women come forward and speak out. Um, You're right. You're right. Yep. Yep. Uh, Chef, thank you for today. Really quickly, um, personal message, what would you like to leave us with? Well, I'd like to say, um, it's. I guess it's, easy to jump on the let's just bash all the men who've abused us thing. And I'm not saying not to do that, because if you've abused a woman, you deserve to be bashed. But I think the greater thing to do is to stick together and help each other and be strong and be proud and never, ever, ever give up our power. Mm. Yeah. For me, please don't ever lose your voice. Please know that today, in today's world, there's someone that will hear you and see you. Thank you, Chef Rossi. Thank you very much for today. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Pat. It was a great show. You've been listening to Raging Skillet Radio, mouthing off with Chef Rossi. Tune in on Transformation Talk Radio, and if you have missed any part of this, check it out at theragingskillet.com or transformationtalkradio.com. Say hi to Chef Rossi, let her know what's on your mind, and we will bring it to the next show. Visit theragingskillet.com, and don't forget to get your own copy of the hit memoir, The Raging Skillet by Chef Rossi. See you next time. The preceding audio was via a Skype call.